Good afternoon. Thanks for being here at Dash. Thanks for being in the fireside chat room. It's my personal favorite room. I think we've got a great session here. Uh, as you might have noticed from the keynote, we think observability and generative AI uh, are going to intersect pretty heavily. They already are. And have a couple experts here to help you separate the excitement from the hype and understand what's practical to help with your observability using Gen AI right now, today. So we have Michael Gerstenhaber, who is VP of Product uh, Management, and uh, Sajid Mahmood, who is VP of Engineering at Datadog. Please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thanks. So yeah, I'm Michael Gerstenhaber. I'm a VP of Product Management here at Datadog. Um, worked on the metrics product for a long time. And, now working on service management and AI ops. Um, and I'll let Sajid introduce himself a little yeah, bit. Yeah, nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm one of our VPs of engineering here at Datadog, and I've partnered with Michael actually for many years, both in our current roles in the past on, on building a bunch of Datadog's products. Um, most recently, uh, Bits AI and some of the other generative AI stuff. And so excited to, to talk to you all about that. Um, I thought maybe to kick it off, Michael, I might ask you, like before we dive into like all the new generative AI stuff, I was hoping you could just sort of set the stage about how AI more broadly is used in observability and what it's useful for and, and how we're looking at it at Datadog. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Watchdog came out uh, for the first time in, in 2018. So we've been investing in AI for, for quite a while, right? Our, our infrastructure product instruments 600 different integrations. We, uh, we afford custom metrics. We have timers from APM. Um, the philosophy has always been that it's much more important to have the data and not need it than to need it and not have it um, during an incident. But that means we, we get an, a voluminous amount of data, right, um, intentionally. So, uh, and AI has always been used to help um, get signal from that noise, right? If we're going to store all of the data, we need to help you get through the data, understand the insights about that data, and to that end, um, we've been doing a lot of signal processing over the years to, to help find outliers, to, to help um, with, with anomaly detection, um, and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing is that uh, AI is used to close the loop on these problems. So we can also kick off workflows, um, inform subject matter experts of what's going on so that they can do their own remediative action. Uh, but really, there's no AI ops without the ops component, whether that's that's human or or jobs that run. Cool. And so from there, like I think I, one thing I've been thinking a lot about is like, okay, so now you know, as LLMs really started to take off in the last year, and I think everybody got a sense of like how broadly applicable they are. As we start to think about how they fit into um, observability and what we're doing here at Datadog, there was a couple interesting things, right? So LLMs fundamentally is like a natural language sort of tool, right? Natural language processing, some code, queries, et cetera. Um, and actually, even though you, like, historically you think of observability data as being sort of time series data, log data, trace data, there's quite a bit of natural language that we, we end up finding ourselves dealing with. Um, and so one of the first things, like I think one of the first things that we, we shipped out the door was summarization. Um, and so, and actually this is probably, like especially in my role as kind of a, um, an engineering leader more than somebody like hands at keyboard doing incident response, uh, the incident summarization, I think, is one, one of the most useful features um, where, like, you know, you get paged into the middle of an incident, um, you're able to very quickly get up to speed. And I found that, like, you know, it's, it's not always perfect, but it is dramatically faster than, like, asking a bunch of questions to get yourself up to speed. You, you usually, you know, get 80, 90% of the way there so that, like, when I join the incident Zoom, I'm, like, very quickly know exactly which questions to ask, the areas of ambiguity. So summarization, I think, has been a big one. Incidence is a big one. I think also when we start to look at just more generally extracting signal from, from noise, um, there's been a lot of interesting work we've been able to do there about trying to summarize that data, both like stuff that's happened over time as well as from like disparate sources of data. Um, translation, I think, has been another big one um, where like we've been doing natural language query translation. Um, where it's really sort of changed the way that you're able to like get data out of your system. Um, and so that's a big area we've invested. And then I think the, the final one, the biggest one that I think uh, all of us saw is it offers us like a new UX model um, where we're sort of in some ways, you know, we think about, you know, historically Datadog has had a, a web interface, right? That's the primary interface for Datadog. We added to that when we added our mobile interface. Um, and more recently, we've been thinking a lot about what the chat interface to Datadog looks like. And LLMs have supercharged that. And so, Michael, I'm curious, 
like, as we think about sort of chat UX, like, where do you see that as being useful? Like, what are the strengths and, and potential limitations of the sort of chatbot UX? Yeah, the strengths are, are clear to me. It's, a, it's, a very, it's where customers are sitting when they're, they're having problems, right? Context switching into the app, finding where in the app to go, right? If you're instrumenting a service, and having to think about whether or not you need to go to real user monitoring to make a query or APM to make a query um, is a lot of heavy mental load. It's a lot of cognitive load. And being able to ask a question from Slack, uh, from Slack or, or Teams or your, your chat ops product um, where there's this like, distance from, from the product itself and you can ask a query, ask a question in natural language, we can interpret that. We know where you've stored data. We've, We've done a lot of um, embedding and training on, on that data, and we know how to best answer it, right? It's an opportunity to disconnect you from the sources of data and, and, and engage you on the problem itself. Um, there are a lot of limitations also, right? This is, an this is a place where you're being interactive. You're making a query, and now you're blocking other conversations, right? It's a very latency-sensitive place. It's a, it's a place where there aren't other things on the screen to give you context. So even though Datadog knows who you are and what you've been investigating, you're not looking at a screen full of dashboards and, and helping you create these queries, right? So we have to do a lot of things like um, Answer, answering narrowly, but also expansively, giving you sort of other follow-up uh, prompts to other, we have to prompt you actually. We, we have to give you um, seeds of, other, of other, other questions you can ask in case we got, we interpreted you wrong um, so that you can continue the conversation with the bot. Um, and then like I say, there, it's, it's a very latency sensitive place. So there are, are trade-offs between the comprehensiveness and the accuracy of a model and how long it takes to run and where we have to switch to GPT 3.5 turbo or, or we can choose four, right? Um, the, the faster we have to return an answer, the lower quality it is potentially. Um, so again, there, we need to allow you to ask follow-up questions um, so that we can get you to a good solution without blocking your workflow. Um, because once you leave a chat, it's sometimes hard to come back to it. Um, what do you see as key limitations of LLMs generally, even without the interaction? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you touched on a couple there, right? Like, especially with the chatbot UX. Like, I think, um, as you said, right, when you're in, in this, like, chat mode, um, you just, like, lack affordances, right? It's, like, much less clear about what it is that you can, um, what you can do in that moment, right? So, like, a good example is um, some data that we have in, in Bits AI is all your service catalog information, right? Uh, what are all your services? Who owns it? Um, I find actually that most of the time if I want to go look who, who owns a service, I'm actually just going to use the, the Datadog UI. It's all there in a the table, I can able to filter it, et cetera. But the times when I've found Bits AI really useful is when I'm in the middle of an incident, in large part because I'm often in, my, in Slack, basically. I'm in Slack talking to my other coworkers, and so they're like not having to to leave that, that modality where I can you know, ask a coworker, like, okay, what are we doing about the backlog here? And then ask Datadog, okay, oh, okay like, who owns that downstream service um, is, is really helpful. And I think like, as an example of how like, as we work through these limitations, we're trying to sort of find the right, the right strengths. Um, so that's more on the UX side. From like, a technical point of view, I think, I hinted at this a little bit before, but one of the big limitations that we found ourselves working through like, as we were building Bits AI um, is the size of the context window. And so when you play with ChatGPT, it sort of might feel like um, you know, it has access to like, the whole internet, and, and it does, right? It's been trained on all that data. But when you ask a specific question, you only have a relatively limited amount of information that you can sort of feed it in. And so that's on the order of, say, 16,000 words, 32,000 words, and all the different you know, model providers are trying to push this limit. I think Anthropic came out with a 100K token context window size. But whatever they're doing, it's still way smaller than like, the billions of log lines that you are feeding into Datadog. And so in some sort of like early iteration when we got started, I kind of hoped, I was like, oh, like, let's just see what happens if we feed it all the observability data and be like, okay, tell me what's going on. Um, but we very quickly realized like, that just doesn't work. Um, and so we ended up having to use and rely on like, a lot of the um, sort of traditional or like, pre-LLM AI methods that, we, um, that we've been developing for the last several years. Uh, in order to kind of figure out which subset of that information that we have should go into that context window. Um, so that's a big one. And then I think you know, the latency is a big one that you touched on as well. And again, like, there are some technical solutions um, to that. Um, 
where you can sort of look at like at like which model performs well. Um, where again, I think eval is a big part of that. Um, and the last big limitation that I think is probably the most well-known limitation uh, of, of LLMs is hallucinations, right? Um, and that's something that we have to be like particularly worried about when you're thinking about you know whether you're doing it directly or indirectly. Like the output of these LLMs are going directly into your systems, right? You're going to scale up, you're going to scale down, you're going to make a decision on this. Um, and so a big part of the engineering that we put into to Bits AI was. Um, was sort of managing that, right? Like being very careful. Some of it's prompt engineering, some of it is sort of post-processing, right? Where we think really carefully about, about um, what ways it might go wrong and adding those extra checks to kind of prevent some of that stuff. So do you think LLMs will displace structured query languages entirely? It's a, it's a good question. So I think like, I mean, the answer I feel like is always a little bit of like yes and no. I think today, like today, they're not going to display structured query languages, right? Like I think um, people are going to continue to use them. But one thing, like you know, things like SQL. One thing I would say about Datadog in terms of like our approach to this stuff is that we've always tried to avoid Datadog being a place where you have to like learn an arcane new query language um, in order to interact with it. Like if you're using Datadog, there's a good chance that you're building most of your queries in our UI, right? Like you're able to set like, oh, I want to group by this or disaggregate by that. Um, and so given that sort of model that we've historically done, I think the natural language querying fits in, fits in really well. Um, I think, you know, where I still see, like, and you, you sort of see this in the Bits AI UX, even though like when you ask a particular question of like what versions is this running or how many hosts um, are affected by the log4j vulnerability, we always make sure to show you the query that it built underneath that. And this sort of, this actually gets to the questions about hallucinations and mistakes and whatever else. It sort of gives you a query that, that you can read and verify. And at least at the current state of LLMs, like I think that's still a place that you're going to need these structured query languages. We want to make sure that like as an end user, you still need to be able to understand what it's doing. Um, as we keep going, as LLMs go further and further on, like who knows? But I think it's worth pointing out that like the part of the reason computer scientists invented structured query languages is because they're just fundamentally more precise than natural language. Um, and you know, historically, computers couldn't understand what you were trying to say unless you were speaking extraordinarily precisely. Like the new innovation with LLMs is that they now have like almost human levels of like contextual understanding uh, to be able to do that. But at the end of the day, I think there are still going to be use, use cases where you want like the formal precision of a SQL or like the Datadog logs query language or metrics. Though that's actually maybe a good, a good place to draw a bit of a distinction. One thing we, we saw with, um, with Bits AI is that we found it much more useful for, at least early on, for logs queries than metrics queries. Um, in part because logs queries are less structured. Right, they, you know, you can just type a collection of words, and that's a that's a valid logs query because we do full text search. Versus metrics is more more structured. Um, it still works super well there, but um, but that was sort of an interesting thing to discover as we were actually building building out bits. Speaking of things that you had to discover, um, in terms of building bits, um, you know, very quickly with, with with a team that consisted of many people, um, did you find anything new in, in structuring the engineering team and, and delivering the products? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I was talking to, to one of our customers a little bit about this. Like when we, oftentimes when we start new products at Datadog, we don't quite know how it's going to land or, or, or like what sort of engineering resources we'll need. And so it's like a little bit too early to create a formal team. And so what we did, uh, what we did with Bits is we, we created what we call a squad, right? So it's just a group of people working together, um, sort of having like a sprint planning, um, a scrum team essentially. Um, across a bunch of different teams. And so we took people who were working on our Slack integration and people with like, deep data science ex expertise and sort of brought them all together. Um, I think one thing that worked really, really well is we had like, a really strong like, single-threaded product owner, um, and that was uh, Kai, who you saw on stage introducing, uh, introducing bits. And that helped like, you know, really having someone focused on like, what the actual user would want out of this. Right? It's very easy. Like, it's sort of funny. Like, the, in some ways, the brief that all of us in this industry have been handled, handled, uh, handed is sort of backwards, right? Normally, like engineering and product teams like to be given a product problem to solve, and then you go figure it out. With this, it's sort of like, okay, we have a revolutionary new technology. What can you do with it? And that's normally like a terrible way to try to build a product. 
Um, but when the technology is so revolutionary and it really does unlock a bunch of new stuff, um, it, you know, that, that's sort of what you end up doing. And so that's why I think having a really strong single-threaded product owner um, helped a ton. I'm also curious for your thoughts on that, Michael. I know you have a couple of, like, you've thought a lot about how data science should engage with engineering as well. Yeah, I mean, traditionally at Datadog, uh, Datadog we've had a, a data science team, and there have been two common models. One is they build a service that has an API that works by contract and other teams depend on them. We have something called an observability graph that we can use for event correlation to see how far one service is from another service and whether or not two events might be related. And it works the same way every time. We can give them feature requests. They'll implement the feature request, but fundamentally, it's a, it's a platform team. Um, we've also had a, a consultant model where somebody who doesn't necessarily know statistics can, can consult with a data scientist. They can help out um, in terms of sharing, sharing their knowledge. But here, what I saw was very interesting is that um, a couple of our data scientists embedded with the team, um, it was very important, again, going back to the fact that there are these tensions in delivering a high quality experience and, and the model consuming so much of the latency available to, to the product owner, right? Um, uh, having our applications engineers understand what the tensions are with the data scientist and, and having the data scientist well understand what was going on on the application side and discuss every day, every morning, what those trade-offs were going to be helped us deliver a, a, a better product. And I think, like, you know, designers since the beginning of when I was at Datadog have always embedded with a product team and a product manager and a couple engineers. Um, having that embedding model helped quite a bit. Um, that was very valuable for us. I agree. Like one one thing where so David was the name of our, yeah. <laughs> our data scientist on this. Um, you know, like very quickly we started to run into some of these latency challenges, and like a lot of the traditional sort of product development engineers, which is you know some of my background as well. When you think of a latency problem, you start immediately thinking of systems type things, and so we started thinking about like working with our partners, like can we get more capacity or whatever else. Um, but David ended up doing some experiments about like starting to think very carefully about token usage, right? Uh, where like the more tokens that you ask it to generate, the slower it is. Um, and even ended up, you know, um, realizing um, that like when you think about sort of function calling, I don't know if folks have played with some of this stuff that, you know, uh, one of the traditional ways that people interact with LLMs, if you want to get them to be agentic, to actually like do things, make queries, et cetera. Um, is to use JSON, have them generate JSON. That's like sort of a structured format. Um, we realized that that actually made us much slower. And so we started looking at ways to sort of, okay, can we make that format like easier for the LLM to generate? And that led to a bunch of speed ups. And it was one of these things where I don't think that would have happened without the embedded model, right? Um, where like I think you can very easily fall into this idea that like, okay, quality is the domain of the like the data science engineers and um, and you know, the performance is something else, and so um, that helped a ton. Now that it is out, out in the open and customers are using it, and we have beta customers, how do we monitor it? How do we make sure it <laughs> functions? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a number of things, right? Like, there's a large chunk of monitoring it and keeping it up that's actually not that different from the rest of our applications, and so of course we are dogfooding heavily, right? We're using our own uh, Datadog products to, to make sure that things are up and running. I do think that the place where this has gotten sort of uniquely challenging um, is eval evaluation. Um, and that actually ends up being critical for like a number of different parts of this, right? Um, if you think about, like, we, you know, Michael mentioned that like you try to think about like, okay, you've got a more powerful model that has higher levels of accuracy, um, but slower, and a, a, a smaller model that's much faster. You know, one of the ways that you need to be able to make a structured decision about which one to use is having like, uh, a strong eval framework so you can say, okay, this is good enough, and so I can send it to that small, the smaller model. Um, so we really, like, as we sort of, like, in the arc of, of developing bits, right, early on it was trying a ton of things, seeing what would stick, seeing which features worked and didn't. As we got to the current phase, a lot of the work started to go into evaluation. So that's a mixture of human evaluation, even using, like, LLMs to evaluate. Um, other LLMs, which is sort of a, an interesting technique, I think it's become pretty standard, where you have one LLM, which is like, you know, Bits AI isn't an LLM, really, it's like a collection of technologies, um, and it's actually using a several different kind of uh, LLMs under the hood, et cetera, but you have, you know, an LLM application, let's call it, producing the output, and then you spin up another LLM to evaluate whether or not it's working. And we found that super useful for like really basic regression testing. Because one of the things that's really challenging now that we have customers using it, as you mentioned, is 
it's very easy to fix one thing and break another, right? Like, you know, fundamentally, like, there's still an enormous amount we don't understand about LLMs, right? There's like a huge sort of area of research on how you sort of try to explain what an LLM is doing, and it looks like not that different from sort of what neuroscience look like and us trying to figure out what brains do. And so it, it makes it much harder to predict. And so you end up having to use very empirical methods of like, okay, I'm gonna make this change, it's gonna fix this bug that we saw, but now please run these regression tests. And you know, the regression tests get harder because, you know, again, LLMs are stochastic. You can't ask them to produce exactly the same um, outcome each time. So I think, I think eval has been kind of the number one investment beyond the like traditional, like how do we make sure things are running well in production uh, that we've had to make for bits. Did anything surprise you in the development of bits? Yeah, I think um, there was sort of a few things. Like one, I would say, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I, it took me a while to realize like how much the like context window would be like a limitation, how much engineering would go into sort of working around um, those, those context window limits. I think that was, um, that was a big one. And then also the, the latency questions, right? I think, um, you know, I, I think when you're playing around with it, you're sort of blown away at like, you st when you first start using it, you're blown away by how powerful it is. But once you get used to that, you start like looking, at, you know, when it takes 10 seconds to reduce a response, even if it's sort of, sort of like what would have been science fiction a year ago, you're still not willing to wait the 10 seconds anymore. Uh, and so realizing like how quickly we got used to it and how quickly our expectations grew from where they were um, was interesting to see. And like, of course, our users are gonna have those same expectations. And so that's still something we're, we're working on now. And you know, it's a mixture of like, making our own stuff more performant, working with our partners, and, and all the eval stuff I talked about. But I think that was also a, a bit of a surprise as well. I found uh, a couple things. Um, the more serious one is that uh, there's a bunch of data, data that Datadog has that, that it's hard for us to expose sometimes in, in our products because, well, it doesn't matter why, but we have a lot of inventory information about what software is running where, at which version, and that sort of thing that we use behind the hood for insights, but we don't always expose in the product. And very like everybody's first questions, our CEO's first questions, our beta testers' first questions, are frequently these pent up demand for things that I didn't even realize people were trying to ask, which is, where is this thing running? When did it last change? That, that, that sort of thing. Um, and, and so I saw a lot of that right away. Um, the other thing is that everybody who gets access to it asks it to talk like a pirate, which was fun. <laughs> uh, um, it asks it for jokes. They're, 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 they're trying to troll us, not us, but they're trying to find the edges of this thing just to sort of have fun with it. And, and I did find we were able to constrain that. Not that that's a challenge for everybody in the room. Um, I think it's inevitably going to be a challenge yeah, for everybody but, in the room. <laughs> no, I mean, not a, yeah. anyway. Um, <laughs> but, but we have been able to constrain it um, and, and, and keep it relatively professional, which has been fun to, to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, do you have any, just wrapping up, I guess, but do you have any advice for, for teams looking to build their own LLM apps? Yeah, it, it's a good question. I think, you know, as I said, I do think that the hardest thing here is um, what I mentioned earlier, where it's sort of an inversion of how you usually should do product development. Um, and so I think it's actually where, where normally I would say you start with a problem and then find the best technology to, uh, to solve that versus, you know, Oftentimes, when you're starting on this, it's like, what can you do with LLMs? I think one thing that we did well here that worked is that we had like sort of an explicit time period where we were doing sort of R&D, where we were trying to see like what's possible. It was very much like sort of brainstorming rules where no idea was was too silly. We would you know, and there was like a lot of sort of hackathon energy. We actually did run a like company-wide hackathon several months ago um, to sort of serve as idea generation. Um, but then once we sort of went through that phase, we started to whittle it down and said like, okay, now which of these ideas are solving real problems for our customers, right? And so I think like, you know, although you do have to start from what the technology can do, like making sure that you don't lose sight of, okay, like what are the biggest problems that our customers have? How can we actually solve them with this is probably, um, probably the single most important thing I would, I would highlight. Cool. I think. We're ready for Q and A. Or are we at great? Yes, time? I have yeah. failed you as the MC. There's a QR code that you can scan on the slides to submit your questions. 
I apologize for not mentioning that at the beginning. But you do still have time because we have a few questions from people that uh, decided to scan that QR code anyway. Mm -hmm. And we'll start there. So get your questions in, scan that, scan that code. Um, but to start with, do you use prompts and feedback uh, to the responses generated for one customer to improve prompts and feedbacks for all the other customers? Are, are you taking user input and making the model better for everyone? We are not making the, well, you correct me if I'm wrong here. Go I'll take it. it first, but keep yeah. me honest. <laughs> Go for um, it. We do not I improve the model right now um, with cross-tenancy questions, but um, we do work with customers very closely and understand what they are trying to ask and whether or not those questions are probably going to apply to other, other customers. And we might take that as learning that we, you know, launder and abstract many times, but, but feedback into the product as potential prompts that other people might be interested in, certainly. That's more of a product manager question in a human endeavor than it is a training endeavor, but um, certainly it's been, been useful. You might be, have a... Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. Like, what I would say is that, like, when we have talked to customers, we see a problem, oftentimes it, like, becomes a test case for us, right? Um, and so at that point, it's sort of abstracted away from the customer's particular data, but at least so far, like, we're still pretty early. Um, that's, that's what we've been doing. How does Bits AI balance giving an answer versus the right answer? Yeah, this is my favorite part so far. Um, Sajid can help us with how we do it. Um, I've just been focusing on whether we're doing it. But, um, but if you ask one, one of the biggest, one of the most obvious questions you can ask is, um, is there anything wrong or is there an issue? An issue can be interpreted in, in many, many ways, right? If there's an ongoing incident that people are working on, you might be looking for what might be causing that incident, not the incident that you already look for. Um, an alert might be an issue about a service, any alert, right? Um, and so, so again, I'll, I'll defer on, on, on how we do it, but what we do is we try to interpret it all of the ways that, that we could and and, and structure the response in a way that that is clear, right? So there are incidents, there are alerts. We looked upstream, you know, to to other services that your service is sending um, HTTP requests to. There are three alerts about that, and and structuring it well, you know, formatting it well helps a lot with that. Um, but we do try to answer broadly and not narrowly in almost every case because of that, um, where it's interactive. Yeah, I think that touches on one of the interesting challenges we had. So, so again, not to dive like too deeply into like the architecture of, of its AI, but like we've got our own sort of orchestration framework, and and one of like the standard concepts in these sort of LLM applications orchestration frameworks is like you have a number of tools, right? Like a number of capabilities um, that that bits can do. Um, and so, when you come back to like, okay, how do you how do you balance providing an answer versus the right answer? One of the things we struggled with was like how to prompt like the overall prompt, doing that prompt engineering um, to figure out which tool it should use, right? Oftentimes we'd be like, oh, like if it, this question would be, gr would, would get a great answer if it goes and queries my company's Confluence page, but it doesn't actually do that. Like it needs to learn to do that. And so um, uh, that was a place that we just, we spent a lot of energy as well. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, it comes back to prompt engineering, um, which you can read a ton about, but really a lot of prompt engineering is trial and error. Uh, at the end of the day, and like what makes it prompt engineering rather than just trial and error is really nailing that that eval part of it, right? And so we did find that like sometimes we'd make a change, and then randomly bits would start saying I don't know much more frequently. Um, other times we'd make another change, and it would that would go away, and it would start answering much more frequently. And I I think maybe the last thing I want to touch on the thing that you worry about if you like try too hard to make it to give to always give you an answer is that it will just give you a wrong answer, hallucinate an answer. Um, and so that's why like another major sort of design principle that we kept looking at is making sure that like what whatever bits told you was like self-evidently verifiable, right? That you could, you know, that it would provide a link, that the answer would be to provide a link to a screen in Datadog, or it would be to provide a query and its results, right? And so the query and the results part is not using any sort of hard to interpret magic. It's that part is like just sort of vanilla um, application code, uh, but you can get to verify that. And so at the end of the day, it's sort of a mixture of balancing all these things and, and making sure that you have like a structured sort of eval engineering process to actually get there. Are there any long-term plans or strategies for customers that cannot have their data sent to third parties like OpenAI and that sort of thing? 
So I, I can take this one. So yeah, we are we are partnering with with OpenAI right now. I think um, at the same time, like there's a bunch of our own technology that's also in Bits AI, and so like we don't have anything like sort of concrete to announce here, but we are playing with like a ton of these different LLM adjacent technologies. So like you know, for now the product is going to you know that is where it is, where we are partnering closely with OpenAI. But I think over time you'll see like some you know potentially some of the capabilities. Um, we're able to do sort of entirely inside our own our, our own infrastructure, um, and we're also you know I think the other sort of question here is like we're also happy to sort of engage with our customers and, and be very clear about what data is going where and seeing if we can kind of evolve the product to address some of those concerns. Um, but I you know one thing that I think has been actually really exciting to see is that. Um, and this was a surprise to me, like if you rewind like six months ago versus now, is sort of the strength and vibrancy of the, like, the open source LLM yeah. community. Um, sort of, I think potentially like gives us more opportunities to be able to offer some of these features uh, uh, without necessarily having to work with third parties when that doesn't work for the customer. Here's uh, one on the softer side. Can you tell us how you chose the name Bits AI for the product? Oh. <laughs> Well, Bits is the name of the mascot. Um, you've probably seen Bits in the corner of your screen for many years. Um, Bits has always, always had a name, uh, and we reused that name, gave them, gave them um, cool VR headset, and now we have uh, Bits AI. Uh, the funny thing about it is that like, as soon as we started this, like, we, we got the squad spun up. Um, like, the, the icon was just the Datadog logo, because what else would it be? Uh, and so we just started calling it Bits. Um, and so that's just, that was sort of the internal code name, it was Bits. Um, and then when it came time to like select a name, of course we did all this work with like brand design and, and considered like, you know, 10 different options and all this stuff, but we landed it at Bits AI. <laughs> are there any types of questions that are still very difficult to answer? And the second part of this question is um, how has uh, has this improved anomaly detection? Is there any higher signal that you can get using these tools now? So I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll start actually maybe with the second one on the anomaly detection. So I'm trying to think. I don't think there's anything that we're doing with Bits AI today that I would describe as anomaly detection. And part of that, again, Bits AI is more than just LMs, but obviously that is part of like what, what gave birth to it. Um, is that you know, LLMs are, are not good at math, right? Um, that's actually one of the limitations that I, I probably should have mentioned, right? Like if you go to ChatGPT and ask it to multiply like two, three digit numbers, like you're not gonna get, you're unlikely to get the correct answer, I should say. Um, and you know, Datadog is dealing with trillions of num numerical data points a day. A lot of what we need to do is do a ton of aggregations and time and space and all that stuff. Um, and so we have really strong statistical methods, um, like AI-driven methods for doing anomaly detection, and those work really well. Um, and that's not really the place where we're looking to apply LLMs. Another opportunity here is that a lot of those can happen asynchronously. So it can look at structured data, and it can produce more structured data that we can store for bits to query later, right? And that helps us a lot with the latency to not have to figure out anomalies in real time while the customer is waiting for a response. Yeah, and then I, I, I guess I realized there was the first part of the question of like what, oh, what questions does it still struggle to answer? And I would say, I mean, you know, there, like there's a whole, a whole range of different sorts of things that people sometimes throw at it. Um, I think one thing that's been sort of interesting has been, again, managing hallucinations when it comes to, um, uh, like, for example, like metric queries. Uh, that's a place where like sometimes, like we early on we would saw, see that like, you would ask it a question, it would invent a metric that perfectly encapsulates your question and try to query it. And so putting, we've, we've, still, we've put a lot of energy into sort of limiting that, um, and we, we do ultimately catch that um, at the end, but that's a place where I think we're gonna have to continue to invest. Yeah. Do you see uh, something, something like Bits AI becoming the main interface in the future? Is this something that could disrupt how we interact with, with Datadog? I think one of the most beautiful things about having this interface is not having to know the source of data that you are querying, um, which, is, which is nice. Um, Sajid talked earlier about a, you know, a lack of precision and interpretation of intention, um, and that will get better and better. And, and whether or not it becomes the primary mode of interacting with Datadog really depends on how well we do that. Um, but 
I think if you are asking a question about a service and you don't exactly know where to find um, the data or you're new to Datadog, certainly it's going to become a, a common interface anyway, if not, if not the primary. Yeah. I would say, like, I think, the, one, it's important to remember that Bits AI is more than just the chat interface, yeah. right? Like, it's, there's a number of other AI, in, like, powered experiences that we're, we're sprinkling into Datadog. I'll maybe, I mean, this is sort of like my own personal prediction here. Like, I don't think that the chat interface is going to ever sort of fully replace, uh, like, sort of a web interface, right? There's just, you know, there's multiple, there's multiple modes of sort of communicating information, and like a sequence of text is great, but sometimes you want data visualization, right? And so um, you want to see things laid out. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways that LLMs could change the fundamental web UI of, of Datadog. Like, you know, one of the things that we've started to play with is like, okay, like as you explore Datadog and we sort of get context of how you're using it, can we gather that information and sort of helpfully suggest, you know, like additional information that you should go to or like what else you should do? And that might not be a chat interface, right? I think we want to stay extremely far away from anything sort of clippy-like, um, but I think there's, there's a lot of room to sort of play with um, in terms of like what that interface will change like without necessarily being strictly chat. Do you use generative AI to do anything else at Datadog, for example, to augment tech support? Um, we don't use it with our support team, to my knowledge, but that's outside of my domain of expertise, I guess. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. We are, go on. No, go ahead. I was gonna go back to observability a little bit, um, because a lot of what we're focused on is closing the loop and helping customers take action on their observability data. So we've spent a long time um, on stage here talking about querying data out of Datadog, but you saw with the static analysis or error tracking products, um, producing code that customers can run to resolve their issues, to button up problems, is a big focus of ours also. And that's not really observability so much as taking action. Um, running workflows, running workflows and filling out the form interactively and, and, and stuff like that um, is, a, is a going to be a major focus and, and you know, whether or not that's the spirit of the question or not, I think, I think outside of observability. Yeah, I would say like, you know, when you email support at datadoghq.com, you're still 100% talking yes, to a human. Yes, I should clarify that. <laughs> um, uh, but I do think that like, you know, we put a lot of work actually, like, you know, one of the first things that we played with um, that a lot of companies did is like, Oh, like, well, what happens if you throw all your docs into, oh, yeah. you know, OpenAI, use the embeddings, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. But anyway, throw all your docs uh, and build a Q&A bot. And so that's one of the first things we've done. And so I do think there's room for Bits AI to, to change the support model, right? Maybe you need to spend less, like, maybe you're less likely to need to go to support because you can ask a question of, like, exactly what tags are available on this AWS metric, and it'll just sort of spit it out for you without you having to figure out where to navigate. So examples that have been shown so far are bits showing uh, individual widgets. Are there plans to enable it to build entire dashboards and show us stuff we didn't even know we wanted to see? Yes, uh, <laughs> building dashboards, building workflows, um, producing content is something that generative AI is very good at. Um, yeah, and we did, we did launch it for synthetics, like, or, or, or you, you saw that announcement for synthetics. But honestly, building dashboards, like I said, we did this like, huge brainstorming thing, and that was one of the, you know, somebody in our hackathon did actually um, hack up something that like, sort of built up dashboards. But in the end, like, when you're sort of driving towards launch, you end up picking things that, that work the best for us. I think super excited about building dashboards. I'm also really excited about um, applying generative AI to building workflows, right? Like, you know, GitHub Copilot has obviously been super popular, and as we think about letting customers author their own automations, like, we're, of course, very interested in seeing how we can make that dramatically simpler, easier, you know, get you, like, an autocomplete that feels, you know, super intelligent. I think this will be the final question, but do you think that AI will be a differentiator for Datadog as a company? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I believe it will be. I believe that um, because we do have uh, the, the 10 trillion points per day coming in, because we have access to all the data, it, it's beneficial to be towards the bottom of the stack, to be able to see containers spin up and down in real time and not be relying on a third party to give us event-driven data. To do that, um, we're in a good place to build integrations with other things like customer wikis, like ticketing systems, um, but still have access to the raw underlying data with which to, to work. Yeah, like I, I think the differentiation, 
I mean, I don't want to undersell our data science teams. Like, I do think we have like some of the strongest data scientists in the business. Like the algorithms we've done with like our, our sketch interface, our DD Sketch, etc. But I, I think the real differentiation is in that data. Like, I think where we've always been differentiated is just the breadth of platform data, right? It's not just that we have metrics, but it's metrics, logs, traces, RUM data, like that, you know, I think a, a good example of this is the dynamic instrumentation, where adding that runtime context really made the error tracking much better. And so I think um, having all that data together will be the differentiator for us in, in this new AI-driven world. Fantastic, thank you so much for the fireside chat. Thank you. And thank you everybody, thank you.